What's up everybody and welcome back to my channel. This is my first video since hitting 1000 subscribers and I just wanted to take a minute and just say thank you for being part of the community and for watching and engaging. It means so much to me. So thanks for being here. Today we're going to be talking about Lightroom in 2023. We're going to discuss first and foremost which version to use and then we're going to go through and talk about Lightroom from top to bottom. Every single fader and tool in Lightroom and just see exactly what it does and how they relate to one another. And ultimately this video is not just for people that are new to Lightroom but also advanced users that may be able to gather some new information or a new way to interact with the app. Now my channel at the very top, if you look at my channel page, says that I like to talk about photography and philosophy. And we're gonna bring these two worlds together as we talk about Lightroom because there's a lot of philosophy that goes into how we approach editing our photos and also how color and light relate to one another and how we understand that. And so that's what this video is about. The best way to use this video is to either watch it from start to finish through its entirety, or you can just look ahead and use the tool at the bottom of YouTube to scroll to the different chapters and see what would be most helpful or most meaningful to you. And ultimately, I hope that my experience using Lightroom over the last 15 or more years will help you on your journey to understanding editing and coloring and really processing digital photos. So with all that said, let's jump right in. The first thing I wanna talk about is which version of Lightroom to use. I feel like for the last few years, we've been trending into a weird place with Lightroom. They launched Lightroom many years ago. I, I think I started using Lightroom around 2010, maybe, maybe earlier, I don't quite remember, but it was around 2010 that I started using Lightroom. Well, down the road, many years later, they released a mobile version of Lightroom. Then Adobe did this thing where they created the cloud version of the apps and the regular version of the apps, and you had Lightroom CC, Creative Cloud, and you had Lightroom. And now fast forward the last few years, they've had what they call Lightroom Classic, which is the OG Lightroom, and Lightroom, which is the new version of Lightroom Cloud. And if you have been using Lightroom for some time, it's most likely you know and live in Lightroom Classic. Lightroom Classic is a very powerful app that really prioritizes cataloging, databasing, as well as having different print features and those kinds of things. Whereas Lightroom, not classic, not cloud, just Lightroom is the cloud-based version that allows you to store your entire library in one catalog in the cloud. And it makes total sense that Adobe would do this because they want to sell you a cloud subscription service in addition to the subscription service you're gonna to pay to use the app. And it was about two years ago that after really thinking through the future of Lightroom and the experience of using Lightroom, I, I just really felt that Lightroom, not Lightroom Classic, was getting a lot of the modern feel as well as modern functions. When I look at Classic, it feels very classic as an app. Two years ago, I decided to retire Lightroom Classic for my personal use and begin to work fully in Lightroom. Now, one great benefit of this was that I was able to take my entire catalog of, at the time, maybe 12,000, 15,000 photos that I have archived and move them into the cloud. And so, yeah, I bought a little bit of cloud storage through Adobe, but what that did for me was it gave me the ability to pick up my iPad and edit with an Apple Pencil, which is really a ton of fun. In fact, I even went through a season where I was just using Lightroom on my iPad. It also gave me the ability to have my entire library anytime I need it. And as somebody who builds presets and always exploring color and light and, and tweaking things, it's fun to pull up photos from seven or eight years ago, some raw files and jump right into editing them. So for those reasons, I really enjoy using Lightroom. I like the look and the feel of it on my laptop. I like the look and the feel of it on the iPad. Not really in love with it on the phone, but I don't do any serious editing on my phone, so it's kind of irrelevant for me. Which version should you be using? If I was recommending a new user into Lightroom, I 100% would recommend Lightroom, not Lightroom Classic. I do believe Adobe will eventually retire Lightroom Classic. They are only holding on to it because of the legacy users. 
and eventually you're going to see it retired and it's just gonna be Lightroom at that point. So you might as well go ahead and get used to the Lightroom system now because this is the future, in my opinion. Now I don't work at Adobe. Adobe is only about 15 miles down the road from my house. Maybe I should show up there and just ask them. And before we jump into our next category, uh, I just wanna add that Lightroom Classic does have a feature that Lightroom does not have, and that is camera calibration, which is at the very bottom of the panel. You will not find that on Lightroom itself. You will only find it on Lightroom Classic. This is a pretty old tool that was used to tweak the hue and colors and the shadows and, and how some of the red, green, and blue uh, tones would interact. Uh, with each other in different RAW files, that is not really necessary anymore. But many photographers have built it into their presets and into their looks using those areas to tweak. You can still get those exact same looks in other parts of the app today. But some people really hold on to that camera calibration as part of their workflow. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it is only available in Classic. And if that is important to you, then you should use Classic. Or if you're thinking about moving, stay with Classic. Okay, so enough about the version of Lightroom. Let's take a look at what's happening in the app. And as we get into the app, we are gonna be talking about the philosophy of light and color, because that is what a photo is. It is a spectrum of light and a spectrum of colors. Light and color interact with each other in different ways. So as you add light, you're actually removing color, and that's what pure white is. It's the absence of color. As you take away light, you're adding color, you're, you're adding saturation to your photos because as you remove light, you're creating black, which is a combination of all the colors. This is what is pretty important to understand about the tone curve when we start talking about it in a few minutes. In this world, we're dealing with RGB. We're dealing with red, green, and blue. But most people understand the primary colors as are YB, red, yellow, and blue. And here's why. RGB is additive. The more you add, the closer you get to white. Whereas RYB, which we would use in painting or any physical arts, is subtractive, which means that the more you add, the closer you get to black. I and mean, think about it. You take a bunch of colors and mix them on a palette, and it's gonna get dark, but it's different when you're dealing with RGB in Lightroom because as you start adding red and green and blue, you're gonna push things to white, not black. So I think that's a little bit of a philosophical difference between what is a tangible way of looking at color versus a digital way of looking at color. And again, as we get into the tone curve, you'll see this play out. So now we are looking at Lightroom and what you see in Lightroom is I've chosen this photo because this photo is going to help us understand all of the parts of Lightroom. And let me tell you why. We have a pretty textured sky. We've got sunlight hitting the Golden Gate Bridge. We have a lot of shadows. We have some things in the photo that are distracting that we're going to remove, specifically the group of people that had just performed an elopement and they are walking back up the beach. We've got a lot of texture and a lot of diversity in our colors. This photo will really be a great usage study as we look at what all Lightroom can do. And I'm gonna make this photo available for you and you can grab the link down in the description below and download the raw file for yourself and play around with it and see how it works for you. So the first thing we wanna look at with this photo is let's take a look at the very top of Lightroom at the histogram. And hopefully you're seeing here that this photo was pretty decently exposed. It's a touch underexposed, but we're shooting digital, so why not? This histogram at the top is actually giving you the RGB levels and the light level. You've got the blue, the red, the green, all in waveforms represented here from total black on the left to pure white on the right. And this is showing you where all of the light is hitting inside of RGB, as well as the gray, which is your overall light. If I begin to take that up with the exposure, it pushes the histogram to the right. And now as we've added RGB and we've added color, we've pushed it to white. As I subtract, we push to black. Do you see what I was getting at earlier when I was talking about how RGB is additive 
versus the primary colors on a palette are going to be subtractive. So as we begin to look at the top to the bottom, we're gonna talk about what every little function is. Let's start with our profile. Think of the profile as a way for Lightroom to understand the raw file. So you have various profiles in Lightroom and then you can install your own or download some to install as well. So let's take as an example, this Canon Colors on Sony profile. I made this years ago as I was transitioning from a 5D Mark IV to a Sony a7R 3 I took many of the exact same photos at the exact same time with the exact same settings and I created not a preset but a profile because a profile lets me apply any preset and go through all these changes um, through Lightroom. A preset applies changes to all the sliders in Lightroom but a profile is kind of how Lightroom understands the RAW file. So this Canon Colors on Sony was created to replicate colors on my Sony for the presets I had at the time. And you'll see a few others in here as well. Like here is a film profile, Kodak Gold 100, and a few more that I use. But the profile does not affect any of the tools in Lightroom. It's truly just how Lightroom understands the RAW file. By default, it's going to be on Adobe Color or Adobe Standard or you can choose your camera matching ones if you wanna make it look the way your camera makes it look. It's up to you, but that's what the profile is at the very top. Let's jump into the light section. You've got exposure, which is how much light is in the photo overall. It's kind of your overall setting. It moves it all up and all down. Contrast is how much separation there is between the blacks and the whites as we remove contrast. We put less separation as we add contrast, we put more separation. The highlights represent the top end of the light spectrum. And as I pull them down, it only affects the brighter areas and you can watch the histogram move. The shadows, the same thing, but with dark parts of the photo, which by the way, as we pull the highlights down and push the shadows up, we are doing the same thing really as removing contrast. And that's how you need to think about all this, everything comes down to light and color. At its simplest, purest forms, it's all light and color. Whites are kind of like the top end of the contrast. As you pull them up, the whites get increased and the same with the blacks. As you pull them down, the blacks get deeper. You can do a lot to style your photo in the light section, but for me, it's the last part I typically will touch. Continuing on, we get into the tone curve, which is probably the most intimidating part of the Lightroom app. What we see in the tone curve is our histogram with a grid laid over it. In this grid, you have the ability to shape the transitions or the points of light from the darkest being the bottom left and the brightest being the top right. So one thing you can do is grab these little intersecting points just as an example. The bottom part is going to be my shadows and my darker parts and the top is gonna to be my whites and my highlights. If I pull down the top right, I am redefining what is white in the photo and I'm getting rid of it. I'm actually saying, hey, the very brightest part of this photo cannot exceed this point. If I move the shadows up, I'm doing the same thing. I'm saying black no longer can be black, but it has to be something maybe further up the light spectrum. If you look at the histogram, this is reflected. Here we have black. As I move it up, I'm redefining where black is. You use the tone curve to create contrast. And so if I pull this down and push this up, I have added contrast to my photo because I have separated the darkest parts and the brightest parts, which is exactly what I could do with the contrast slider but I'm doing it here in the tone curve. If we look at the tone curve, we're also gonna see the RGB, the red, green, and blue have their own respective curves. So I could come in here and do the same thing. Let's pull this down and push that up. Well, now the photo looks kind of crazy, but what if I right click and copy that across the green channel and the blue channel? Now, all I've done is I've added contrast because I've separated 
the red brights from the red darks, the green and the blue, which my whole photo is an RGB photo. It's made up of those three colors. I've just added contrast. This is the same thing I could do again by moving the contrast slider, but this is just a different way to do it. This is gonna style it a little differently as well. One way you can begin to style your photos in the curve is by doing things that maybe you prefer in your look. So let's say you want uh, a little green in your shadows. I come down here and I just lift green a little bit in the shadows and now my shadows are going to have a bit of a green tint to them. You can kind of see that happening. Let's look over here at this rock. Nothing and then do you see how this, the, the sand and the rock now are a touch green? And that's only by barely lifting the shadow on the green curve. But like, let's say I come in here and now I want to make the sky a touch more blue. And again, it's only going to affect the part of the light in the, in the photo that is represented in the curve. And so I'm on the top half, therefore I'm really only affecting highlights. But just these two small tweaks to this photo now have styled it some. I've gone from this to this. And that is with only two very small tweaks. There's also this feature on the right side of the tone curve where I can come in here and define these points and grab them fairly similar to the way I would do on the first part of the tone curve. But what's cool about this is I can come in, I can do some tweaks here, but then come over here and I get a fresh curve to now go back and further make my changes, define my points. And so the tone curve is the most powerful part of Lightroom. And if there was one area that they would keep and remove every single area, I would say the tone curve is it. Because as a creator or an artist or a photographer, you could have a hundred people take this tone curve and create a hundred different looks just with it alone. The thing about the tone curve also is it's super subtle. The smallest movements make actually fairly large impacts. And so as you're playing with the tone curve and as you're learning to use it, minimal changes are best. The color section is pretty huge. It starts with our white balance, which you set in your camera manually or your camera did it through auto white balance. And you can always change that to your liking. You can add that warmth. You can add that cool, what, whatever works for you. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on white balance. Vibrance and saturation. Okay. They seem like they do the same thing when you start moving them, but vibrance is adding light to the color and saturation is just increasing the intensity of the color. So how that plays out in my experience, if I want to make the photo a little more contrasty and add color, then I turn up vibrance. If I want to just make the photo more colorful or less colorful, I use saturation. Okay, let's look at the color mixer. This is another part of the app that is really important to how you style your photos. What we've got here are all of our different colors and these spectrums that are gradient between them. So let's just take red for an example, because the Golden Gate Bridge is red. This first slider on all of these colors is the hue, which is how we define red. So the app has a default definition of red and orange and yellow and so on, but I can change that. I can make that red maybe more towards a purple, or I can make it more towards orange. This is my spectrum of what I can define as red. Saturation is going to increase the intensity of that red. So let's say I wanted to make it a little more towards purple and crank the saturation. I now have this crazy looking photo, as you can see. Luminance is how much light that color is pushing. Remember, as I add light, I'm actually removing color. So if I was to take the luminance of red up, it's going to be less saturated. But if I bring the luminance down, if you look at the bridge, it's more saturated. Now luminance is light. And so I'm actually taking the light down, but as I decrease the light, I'm adding color. As I increase the light, I'm removing color. These three sliders in every color allow you to do some pretty awesome tweaks to your own liking. And you can style a photo any way you want. So a couple of common things, 
is to take yellow and push towards orange, take blue, push towards teal, and already I think this photo is trending a little better. And to reset everything, we just double click it. I also love how Lightroom will put these little dots under things you've touched. So that is our color mixer. Let's talk about color grading next. In color grading, you have the ability to add a color, a hue, a saturation, and luminance over your shadows, your midtones, and your highlights all separately. Then you can determine how much of that color overlay you want over your photo, as well as how you want to balance the relationship between what you added to the shadows and added to the highlights. It honestly sounds pretty complicated, but it isn't. Let's, let's take a look. I'm gonna click on the shadows. I love putting warmth in the shadows. So let's just take it to 25. You can see right here where 25 is. It's kind of reddish orange. I'm gonna bring the saturation up. Pretty ridiculous for now. This is a lot of saturation for shadows, but maybe that's what I'm going for. I could bring the luminance down to get more contrast, or I could push it up to get less contrast from my shadows. Let's go to the highlights. Let's add some blue into the highlights. Now, one thing that's really annoying about Lightroom, not Lightroom Classic, are these pop-ups. You, you can't get rid of them. They're always trying to educate you. And it's like, come on, let me move on. <laughs> so as I'm moving this up, you're seeing the horses here. Get out of there. And you see how my sky now has this overlay on it. It's only really affecting the highlights. And let's say I wanna take those highlights and pull them down a little bit. This photo is getting pretty ugly, but you understand how color grading is working. I can click on this little eye here and take away my color grading. And then there's midtones, which are kind of overlay across the whole, the whole photo. You can kind of see if I throw some green on here, how the midtones are kind of everywhere. This may help you just put this little touch on, on here if you were looking to do something like that. And again, you can mess with the luminance, but color grading is pretty powerful, especially in creating a cinematic look because you can put like really nice blue and teal in your shadows and a really nice golden orange on the, the highlights and the midtones and get this really cinematic look. So that kind of wraps up the color part. Now remember, the tone curve also greatly affects color. And so between the tone curve, your white balance, your color grading, your color mixer, and your saturation and vibrance, you have a lot of options and variety you can do with color. Next up, we've got our effects. We've got texture and clarity. Both texture and clarity are adding contrast and separation to the already contrast and separated lines in your photo. That sounded really confusing, but let me just show you what it's doing. If I increase the clarity, all that's going to do is add contrast and all of the things in this photo that have separate connections. I don't know if I'm doing a very good job of explaining this. <laughs> clarity and texture. You feel like when you use them, you're making the photo sharper but what you're really doing is adding contrast. Because remember, everything we're doing in here is contrast and light or color. That's it. But as I push clarity, the photo does look sharper, but it looks sharper in a way that the lines are getting really contrasty. The way I understand clarity is, is kind of at a macro level and texture is at a micro level of doing this. They have two different looks, so experiment with them and see what you like. I rarely, if ever, actually add clarity and I never touch texture. In fact, most of the time I'm removing clarity and you can learn about why I do that in this video I'll put up here at the top as I talk about how to edit in a filmic style. Okay, dehaze. Again, it's just contrast, except their algorithm they built this really does actually remove haze. And as someone that shoots in California a lot, fog and the Bay Area, dehaze is a really helpful tool. If you remove, you're actually adding haze or removing contrast. If you take dehaze to the left, you're really making your photo have a lot less contrast and you take it to the right, let's just go real extreme, you're adding a ton of contrast. 
Now, as we get into the next section, we're getting into very stylistic preferences. And so the first one is vignette. This is simulating what lenses used to do. Some of them still do this, especially lenses on the lower budget side. They create kind of a, a, a tunnel to the photo. So if you like that look, and, and it can be used in a very artistic way. In fact, I always use vignette on my photos. This pulls blacks into the corners. And if I go really crazy with it, you can see we have this shape, this oval in the middle. I can change that with the midpoint. I can change how round that is or square that is. I can feather it and determine may, maybe I want to have a frame instead of like an actual nice gradient. And you can see here that these are all just things that affect a style you can choose on the photo. Some people even will add a white frame by pushing it all the way, determining their midpoint. So that's vignette. We've got grain and I, I did another video explaining like what grain is and how it's used. In this video, you can check that video above me out and watch that and kind of learn about how grain works. But basically in Lightroom, you can simulate film grain and you have how much you're applying, what the size of that grain is going to be and how rough the edges of that grain are. Different film stocks and different quality of film plays a big role in that look. And so if you're going for a very classic, realistic grain look, study the film what it looks like that you want to emulate and then recreate that grain pattern right here in Lightroom. And, and yeah, it's only three faders, but it's pretty diverse what you can do with these three faders. So be sure to try that out and play around with it. Next up, we're into the detail section. Sharpening is how crispy these edges are. Now, when it comes to sharpening, if you're using modern lenses on modern cameras, your photos are pretty sharp already. I am never one to advocate for adding sharpness, in fact, just like clarity, I often take sharpness away. There's one little trick here. If you hold the option key down and you move sharpening, you can see your lines a little better. And if you hold option key down, and I'm assuming you're on a Mac, I believe that's probably the alt key or the control key on Windows. But if you hold that down and you, you move the masking fader, you actually see what is getting sharpened. And so you have this like really weird looking overlay. And so if you are gonna add sharpening, I highly recommend you use the masking tool first to determine what you actually want to sharpen. So you can see here, there's so much texture in this photo. I don't want all that to be very sharp. So I'm gonna add none of it. It's very easy to overdo it. And to me, if I see a photo with a ton of sharpening and clarity added, I can recognize it right away. And automatically I go to like amateur hour, you know, because you don't need to do that. Your noise reduction. I don't find it very helpful in Lightroom. I feel like when I shoot at a very high ISO, if I need to reduce noise, I use a different app. I use Topaz, Denoise. I just think it does a much cleaner, better job. But essentially what noise reduction is going to do is it's going to take the noise that your sensor has generated and try to smooth it out. But what happens is it softens the lines in your photos some and, and makes it a little less sharp. So again, this is an area you can play with, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on sharpening and noise reduction because I don't want to encourage you to use it. I think you're better off without it personally. Next up, we'd have this optic section where you can remove the chromatic aberration and, and older lenses and cheaper lenses tend to do this where as the light hits the different glass throughout the lens, it creates a purple or a green halo around some objects, especially bright objects or objects that have a lot of contrast. Lightroom can try to remove that for you. You can also use the defringe tool to try to remove it yourself manually. And then lens correction, what it's basically doing is taking any distortion that is happening within your lens, basically trying to, to fix it, which if you were to click on lens correction, you'll see that if your lens had any vignetting, maybe you didn't even notice it, it goes away with lens correction. Also, if you're using very wide lenses, like say you're shooting at like a, a Sigma at a 12, millimeter, which I used to do that on Canon for some architectural stuff. The corners were so distorted. They were so stretched and looked so bad. And so lens correction would help fix that a little bit. The last section is the geometry section. Don't think of geometry as cropping. It's more like using the photo on a plane 
to make certain tweaks up, down, left, right, A, B, start, all those things. And so you can use these to do that. Like if I wanted to tilt this way, but you see now I'm getting this really crazy look uh, and that would be a lot, maybe a little too much. Uh, maybe we might do something like this where we are just, you know, pulling the bridge in a little bit. We want to give it more of a fisheye look. Again, I never touch this stuff. And so, uh, but, but teach their own, try it out. If it would make your photos look how you want them to look. Remember, all of this is completely subjective. So do what makes you happy. Okay, so that kind of sums up all the different tools and what they do in Lightroom. Now let's take a look at a few of the other tools on the other panels. The first one I'll point out is the crop tool. And so right here, we have the ability to just make this photo punched in, punched out, aspect ratio, which is the length times width. Like you have the ability to, to do whatever you want to make this photo feel right for you. So for instance, let's say you didn't shoot it very straight. As you click this, you can straighten the waterline out. Man, I, I think I nailed this. It's pretty good, steady hand. Let's say I, I wanted the bridge more in the center. I could pull this side in. And there it is. And now I've got my bridge more centered. Cropping seems pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you have some suggested aspect ratios that are very common. You can do custom aspect ratios as well. Now the healing, the healing section can be really amazing or really terrible. It's really like rolling the dice sometimes, but for the most part, I find it to be really good. So I mentioned earlier, I've got this crowd of people down here. So let's go visit them. I don't want them on my beach in my photo. So I'm, I'm going to start by using the content aware tool. Now I've got content aware, I've got healing, I've got cloning. And the way these work is I have the size, but I also use my trackpad to do this. And I've got the opacity, which is like how see-through it is. Okay, we're gonna get rid of that and come back to it. With the Band-Aid for healing, I have a feather tool, which is think of it as like how sharp the edges are going to be. Is it going to fan out or is it going to be a hard line where I click this, this brush? And the same thing for the clone stamp. It's going to also allow me to feather it and either tra smooth transition it or do a harsh transition. So these people on the beach here, I'm going to try to do a content aware large brush over them. Let's click it and they're gone, but it doesn't look very good. That looks terrible. Delete it. Let's try it with the healing tool. Now when I do that, it's gonna pick another part of the beach and recommend I use that part. So let's go maybe right here. Let's get this opacity 100% and it's too feathered because you can see the edges. So turn the feathering down, but now it's gonna like a little circle within the circle. So maybe this could work. Maybe if I feather it a little more, let's take a look. Nope, still looks pretty bad. Let's try the clone stamp. That is probably the best in this case. Now again, not perfect. And I don't know if I would actually do it this way. Typically when I want to remove something, I generally will put it in Photoshop and use the patch tool. For quick fixes, this works now. And the smaller it is, the better. So I've got these two people up here. These would be really easy to remove. But for some reason, it's grabbing a, a really random section here. One thing that's important to remember, especially when it comes to editing all these little spots, is that your focal point, unless you're shooting it like F16, is on a plane. So the further away it is, maybe like this photo is focused at infinity. So the bridge is in focus, but not everything is in focus all the way to me. I mean, it kind of is. You can see the ground, but there's going to be different points of focus where if you're using the clone stamp or whatever, and you're grabbing from the different planes, especially if you're shooting at like F2.8 or something, it's gonna look really janky because the focal point is not the same. So you wanna go like horizontally, very close to your point so you have the same focal plane. Hope that makes sense, a little pro tip for you. You'll find that that healing section can be very helpful, but it's not perfect. I use it a lot for sensor spots. I have a few up here, so let me just go ahead and remove these. Lightroom does a fantastic job in the sky at removing sensor spots. I mean, they're gone, that's it, see? and you would never know. For me, the most critical part of Lightroom outside of the editing of the colors and the light is this masking section. And this could have a whole video of itself. So we're not gonna spend a ton of time on it because this video is already getting pretty long here. But 
what you have here is you have the ability to automatically select the subject, like a person, uh, the sky, or a background. You have the ability to draw an object and Lightroom's AI will automatically grab it. You have a traditional brush and back in the day, you had a brush, you had a radial and you had uh, a gradient and that was it. And so these next three are what those are, the brush, the linear, which is our gradient and our radial gradient. And then the range selects either the color range, so like I wanna do all the reds, or the luminance range, I wanna do all, everything that is under, what well maybe I wanna do all the shadows, everything under a certain point. And then if it's a nice 3D photo, you can do the depth range as well. This is a landscape shot at infinity, not very 3D. If there are people like a subject in the photo, Lightroom does an incredible job at identifying the person, and then you can mask through AI different parts of them automatically. We used to have to brush people. I mean, I'd go in and have to brush just the white part of their eyes to edit their eyes or brush their eyebrows. And today, Lightroom will select it all for me. It's pretty freaking amazing. And we're living in a crazy time. One quick pro tip I like to do is I love to put a little linear radial at the bottom and just darken it a little bit. It draws your eyes up the photo and, and lets you look at, you know, the middle of the photo. This isn't like some secret. I think a lot of people do this, but it really does help bring your eyes up. Also, another cool thing about these masks is you can do mask on mask and just keep adding them. Let's say I want to do the bridge here, but let's say I wanted to invert this and select everything but the middle of the bridge and make a little vignette. But I'm not using the vignette tool. This is just another way to get to the same thing, which all of, all of Lightroom allows you to do the same thing a lot of different ways which all contribute to the style of your edits and your photography. The best thing you can do is learn how to use these different points and these different, these different tools and the masking and how to manipulate color and light, learn to use the tone curve or just get really good at it and start styling your photos to represent you. It's really easy to buy a preset, click a preset, say the preset did its thing, let me export it and move on but that's not you. You didn't do that. You bought a preset and you threw it on your photos. No, like learn from presets. I, I'm a, I, I have bought a lot of presets over the years. I get them for education. I get them to look at, okay, I love this guy's look. How is he getting that look? Five or six years ago, I would, I would get a preset and I would literally study how they're getting that look. Oh, I see. They're using this to do that. And that was a huge help for me in learning Lightroom. But don't just buy a preset, one click it and move on. Get a preset, study it, learn from it, make it a base for you, tweak it to your liking, and if you like it, right out of the box, that's awesome. Use it because you like it out of the box though, not because you don't know how to tweak it. There's a difference, you know what I mean? Like you don't wanna be the guy or the girl that, that just throws it on because you don't know how to do anything else. Throw it on because you like it, but don't feel imprisoned by it. As you make presets for yourself and you start tweaking things how you like, you can click the preset panel and simply add whatever you want to your own Lightroom preset library. And then you have it moving forward. I have a few families of presets that I've made for myself that I use. They just have random names of different places that I like and I use them for different things. Don't be afraid to find your style and your own vision for Lightroom. Okay, this is by far the longest video I've ever done. I'm actually exhausted from shooting this video and I can't even imagine how exhausted I'm gonna be after I edit it and get it posted. I hope this has been helpful for you. I, I do this stuff because I wanna empower creatives. That's, that's, that's what my end game is, right? Like I am an elder millennial, but I see so many people stepping into this field and I, I get so excited for them because I know what the journey means to me. And I, I wish I would have had tools available to me 15 years ago that are available to me today. I've learned so much through the YouTube community and through others. And so the passing on of knowledge is a huge part of our culture. And so I do this for that reason. I wanna empower you. And so I hope you're empowered today to create, to make great things. And I hope that this video and this channel matter to you. Thank you so much for watching. Drop a comment, ask a question. If you're not subscribed, be sure to subscribe. Continue to support the channel by engaging and I mean, you know how YouTube works. And so uh, if you like this stuff and, and you like what you're experiencing here, help me grow it. Thanks again for watching and I will see you next time.